Have you ever found yourself maybe facing a really big health decision, perhaps about surgery, and you're just wishing you had someone, you know, to cut through all the medical jargon? No, someone just lay it out clearly. Exactly. Well, today, that's what we're aiming to do for you. We're taking a deep dive into total knee replacement, or TKR. It's a procedure that uh, really changes quality of life for so many people. Billions, in fact. So our mission today is to distill all that information, make it clear, give you a roadmap. We want you to understand what TKR is, why it's done, what the whole process looks like, and you know what it actually means if you're considering it. That's the plan. We want this deep dive to give you a really clear, structured overview. You should feel well-informed by the end, but hopefully not overwhelmed. We'll connect all those vital pieces about TKR. Okay, great. So let's start right at the beginning. When we say total knee replacement, TKR, what exactly is that? Well, the sources describe it as a major operation, but one that's done very routinely. Right. And it's designed to basically fix the problems caused by a knee that's damaged or worn out or diseased. Mm -hmm. The actual procedure, it involves removing that damaged cartilage and bone, right? Yeah from the knee joint surface. Correct, and then replacing those surfaces with an artificial joint, usually made of uh, metal alloys and high density plastic. Okay, so it's a replacement. It is, but it's more than just swapping parts. A key thing our sources highlight is the purpose behind it. It's about uh, profound pain relief. Which is often the biggest driver, I imagine. Absolutely, and also ensuring safety and stability in the joint. And interestingly, it can even encourage new bone to grow and kind of integrate with the implant. Oh, interesting. Didn't realize that part. Yeah, it's quite holistic. And that's why it's generally seen as a safe and effective procedure for the right patient. Okay. So what kind of conditions usually lead someone down this path? The sources are pretty clear that osteoarthritis is the main one. That's the big one, yes. By far the most common reason. But the sources also mention other causes. Things like rheumatoid arthritis, which is different, an inflammatory condition, or uh, a major knee injury from the past, or even if someone has a significant knee deformity. Got it. So osteoarthritis is common, but not the only reason. Now, this brings up a really important point. Is TKR the first thing doctors suggest? Oh, definitely not. The sources are quite explicit about this. It's typically considered a, well... A last resort procedure. A last resort. Why is that? The main thing is that the artificial joint itself, it doesn't last forever. It has a limited lifespan. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't want to jump into it too soon if you don't have to. Exactly. So before surgery is even really considered, the focus is on initial management, non-surgical stuff. Right. Like what kind of things? The first line is usually medication for pain and inflammation. Uh, physiotherapy is crucial and often significant lifestyle changes too weight loss if needed, activity modification. Those are always the first choices then. Always. You try those first to manage the symptoms. And what if those things help, but maybe not enough? Or if someone's trying to delay a full replacement? Our sources mentioned some other surgical options. Yes, there are intermediate steps. Sometimes things like an arthroscopic washout and debridement. Think of it like a cleanup inside the knee joint. Okay, like getting rid of loose bits. Exactly. Removing debris, smoothing rough cartilage, then there's something called an osteotomy. Osteotomy? What's that? That's where they actually cut the bone, usually the tibia or femur, to realign the leg slightly. It shifts the weight off the damaged part of the knee. Huh. Clever. It can buy time, definitely. And another one is mosaic plasty. Mosaic plasty. Sounds artistic. Ha! Well, it sort of is. They take tiny plugs of healthy cartilage and bone from a non-weight-bearing part of your knee and transplant them into the damaged area, like filling potholes. Wow. Okay, so there are definitely steps before a full replacement. Absolutely. And there's also partial knee replacement, PKR. Oh, yes, you mentioned that. How's that different? Well, if the damage is really only confined to one compartment or one side of the knee, they can just replace that part. It's a smaller operation than a full TKR. Preserves more of your own knee, then. Exactly, which can feel more natural for some people and recovery might be quicker, but it's only suitable if the damage is limited. Makes sense. Now, you mentioned the lifespan of the TKR implant. How long do they typically last? The sources generally quote around 20 years. 20 years. That's a good chunk of time. It is. But it also means it's probably not a once and done thing for younger patients. Right, which leads to the age factor. Who usually gets these? While technically any adult could be considered, most TKRs are performed on people between 60 and 80 years old. Okay, so what about someone younger, say in their 50s, who needs one? It's a complex decision. For younger patients, a TKR can be life-changing, massively improve quality of life, 
allow them to keep working, stay active. Sounds great, but the downside. The downside is that they're much more likely to outlive that 20 year implant, which means they'll probably need a second surgery, a revision surgery later in life. And revision surgery is tougher. Yes, the sources note it's a more complex procedure than the first one. More bone loss, scar tissue, it's just trickier. Okay, that's a really important consideration. So given all this, yeah. the non-surgical options, the alternatives, the lifespan, what actually pushes someone finally to say yes to a TKR? What are the symptoms? It really comes down to the impact on their life. The sources list several key things doctors look for in the clinical assessment. Let's hear them. Okay. Severe pain, obviously but also swelling and significant stiffness in the knee joint. Pain that just doesn't quit. Right. Pain that isn't managed well by other means. Then there's reduced mobility, just finding it hard to get around. Mm -hmm. People might find their knee gives way unexpectedly, or it locks up or clicks painfully. Scary feeling a bit. Definitely. Yeah. Also, the inability to fully straighten the knee. And then there's the impact on quality of life. Uh when the pain and stiffness interfere with sleep, when you can't do everyday tasks easily, like shopping or even just getting out of the bath. Yeah, that really starts to wear you down. Absolutely. The sources even mention feeling depressed because of the constant pain and the lack of mobility, yeah. not being able to work or have a normal social life. It paints a pretty clear picture. It's not just about the knee. It's about your whole life being affected. Exactly. When you understand that level of impact, the idea of major surgery starts to make a lot more sense. Okay, so let's say someone gets to that point. The decision is made to go ahead with TKR. What happens before the actual operation? You mentioned a clinical assessment. Yes, this preoperative phase is crucial. It's all about making sure the patient is ready and optimizing the chances of a good outcome. So what does it involve? It starts with a really thorough medical history check. They need to make sure you're fit enough for the anesthesia and also for the rehabilitation afterwards, which is demanding. Okay, makes sense. What else? Knee x-rays are standard, obviously, to get a detailed look at the joint damage. Mm -hmm. There's usually a physiotherapy assessment beforehand, too. They look at your current mobility, how you walk your gait. To get a baseline. Exactly. And, of course, they'll confirm all those specific symptoms we just talked about. The pain, stiffness, loss of function, impact on life. It all feeds into the decision and planning. So it's a really comprehensive workup. Seems vital for setting someone up for success. It absolutely is. All right, now we need to tackle something that's always part of surgery. Potential problems, complications. Yes, it's important to be aware. Every surgery has risks. What are the main ones with TKR, according to the sources? The two most common complications highlighted are infection and blood clots. Okay, let's talk about infection first. How serious is that? Well, most wound infections are superficial and can be treated effectively with antibiotics. That's good. But sometimes, though it's rarer, the infection can go deeper down around the implant itself. And what happens then? That can be much more serious. It might require further surgery to wash out the joint, potentially long-term antibiotics, or even, in some cases, removing the artificial joint entirely, treating the infection, and then putting a new one in later. Wow. That's significant. Are there warning signs people should look out for? Yes, absolutely. The sources stress this. If your operated leg becomes unusually hot, very reddened, hard, or increasingly painful after the initial post-op period, those are red flags. Yeah. You need to seek medical attention right away. Okay, good to know. Hot, red, hard, painful. Got it. What about blood clots? Blood clots, or DVT deep vein thrombosis, are another risk after major leg surgery. The real danger is if a piece of that clot breaks off and travels to the lungs. That's a pulmonary embolism, or PE. Exactly, and that can be life-threatening. Is there a key warning sign for PE? The critical one mentioned is chest pains. If you experience chest pains after TKR surgery, especially sudden onset, that's an emergency. Get mm. medical help immediately. Okay, chest pains equals emergency. Very clear. Are there other, maybe less common, complications listed? Yes, the sources list a few others. Things like unexpected bleeding into the knee joint after surgery, mm. damage to ligaments, arteries, or nerves right around the knee during the operation. That's rare, but possible. Okay. A fracture in the bone near the artificial joint. This can happen either during the surgery itself or later on, maybe from a fall. Right. Sometimes people can develop excess bone formation around the joint, which can limit movement. Or similarly, excess scar tissue can form and restrict motion. So stiffness could be a problem down the line. It can be, yes. Other things mentioned include the kneecap dislocating numbness around the wound scar. That's actually 
quite common and often improves over time, or very rarely, an allergic reaction to the bone cement they sometimes use to fix the implant. Okay, that's quite a list. It might sound a bit scary hearing all that. It can, but it's important. Being aware of the possibilities, even the rare ones, is part of being properly informed and prepared going into surgery. Knowledge is power, really. Absolutely. Okay, so the surgery is done. Now comes the really interesting part for many people, the recovery. What happens after the operation? Right, the post-operative phase. Yeah. The immediate focus right after surgery is on three main things. Okay, what are they? Pain relief, first and foremost, preventing those blood clots, DVT, mm -hmm. and getting the knee moving early. Let's break those down. Pain relief, how do they manage that after major surgery? It's usually a multi-pronged approach. During the surgery itself, they might give it what's called bolus analgesia, a strong upfront dose. Okay. Then for the first day or two, often patients have a PCAS. PCA. Patient-controlled analgesia system. It's usually a pump with opioid medication like morphine that you control yourself by pressing a button when you need it, within limits, of course. Gives you some control over the pain. Exactly. Then as soon as you can tolerate it, they switch you over to oral pain medication, pills. And the sources mention something specific not being used. Ah, yes. NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Things like ibuprofen. They're generally avoided right after TKR. Why is that? Because there's some concern they might interfere with bone healing and integration with the implant. So they usually stick to other types of pain relief initially. Interesting detail. Okay, second focus. Preventing DVT, blood clots. How do they do that? Several methods are common. You might have an intermittent pump device on your feet that squeezes them regularly to keep blood flowing. Okay. You'll likely receive injections of low molecular weight heparin, which is a blood thinner, and wear those tight anti-embolic stockings. Ked stockings. Right, the lovely white ones. Those are the ones. And the third, immediate focus, early mobility. Early mobility. How early are we talking? Surprisingly early for many people. The sources indicate patients are often mobilized, meaning getting up and walking with help within just 12 to 18 hours after surgery. Wow, less than a day. With crutches or a walker, I assume. Yes, definitely with two crutches or a walking frame. But getting people moving quickly is key. Why is that so important so quickly? It helps prevent complications like DVT, like we just discussed. It also helps prevent excessive stiffness from setting in, gets the muscles firing again, and boosts confidence. It's really vital. Okay, so pain managed. DVT prevention underway, getting moving. What about physiotherapy? Physio is absolutely central to recovery. It starts very soon after surgery. What kind of exercises? Initially, it's focused on knee flexion, bending the knee, and extension straightening it. Simple exercises encouraged several times a day. To regain movement? Exactly. Increase muscle strength around the knee and regain that range of motion. Now, there will be swelling, so movement might feel limited initially. Does that hurt? It can be uncomfortable, yes. That's why they often recommend taking pain medication before your exercise sessions to make it more manageable. Good tip. Anything else for movement? Some patients, according to the sources, might also use a machine called a CPM. CPM. Continuous Passive Motion Machine. It's a device that gently bends and straightens your leg for you while you're resting in bed. It can help with regaining flexion. Okay, so with all this happening, pain control, physio, mobilization, when are people typically ready to go home? What are the goals for discharge? The sources lay out some typical discharge criteria. Most patients should be able to. Yes. Bend their operated knee to at least 90 degrees. 90 degrees. Okay. That's a right angle. Right. They should be able to walk about 10 meters and manage going up and down a few stairs using their walking aid, like crutches or a frame. 10 meters in stairs. Yeah. Seems reasonable. And importantly, they need to be able to manage their basic personal care with minimal help. Maybe using aids like a shower stool, but mostly independent. Okay, so being safe and somewhat independent at home is key. Absolutely. Once you hit those benchmarks, you're generally ready for discharge, with ongoing outpatient physio planned, of course. And that's when the longer-term recovery really kicks in at home. Our sources gave a pretty detailed timeline for that, didn't they? Yes, they did. It helps set expectations. Can you walk us through those phases? What happens after discharge? Sure. So weeks one to three after surgery, you're home. The focus is on gradually increasing walking distance, continuing to manage stairs, still using your walking aid, and crucially, keeping up with those exercises for strength and range of motion. Consistency is key. Okay, weeks one to three, building endurance, sticking with exercises, what's next? Then, weeks four to six, 
This is often when people start to feel a bit more independent. You might be able to walk and manage stairs without the crutches or frame. Ah, a big milestone. Huge. You'll likely be resuming more normal household chores and activities, maybe returning to work if it's a sedentary job. Driving might be possible around this time, depending on which leg was operated on and doctor's advice. Still doing the exercises. Oh, yes. Still diligently doing the exercises to keep improving or at least maintain the strength and movement you've gained. Okay. Weeks four to six, more independence, back to some activities. What about further out? Weeks seven to 12. Now you're typically walking for longer periods quite comfortably. You might introduce activities like using a stationary bike, which is great for motion and low impact. Still exercising. Still doing the prescribed exercises, yes. And this is often the period where you can start thinking about returning to some low-impact recreational activities. Swimming, maybe gentle cycling outdoors. So it's a gradual progression over about three months to mm -hmm. get back to most normal activities. That's a reasonable time frame for many people, yes. Full recovery, regaining maximum strength and function can take longer, maybe up to a year for some, but that 12-week mark is often a significant point. Right. So what this really tells us, looking at that timeline, is that recovery isn't passive. It requires active participation. Absolutely. That structured, diligent recovery plan, sticking with the physio, it's absolutely essential to get the full benefit from the surgery. It's how you get back to enjoying your life with less pain. We've covered a lot of ground here. We started with understanding what TKR actually is, why someone might need it, looked at the alternatives. Mm -hmm. The whole preoperative assessment phase. Right, the assessment, the potential complications, which are important to know about, and then that whole journey through post-op care and the detailed recovery timeline. Yeah, it's quite a process. By diving into these sources together, hopefully, you now have a much more comprehensive, practical understanding of total knee replacement. And thinking about that whole journey, especially the recovery and the, you know, roughly 20-year lifespan of current implants, it does make you wonder, doesn't it? Wonder what? Well, here's something to think about. With the pace of change in material science, maybe biomechanics, even regenerative medicine, mm -hmm. how might those advancements change the game for joint replacements in the future? You mean like longer lasting implants or maybe different approaches altogether? Exactly. Could implants last 30, 40 years? Could we regenerate cartilage more effectively? What new choices might that open up for people facing these decisions a decade or two from now? It's fascinating to consider how this might evolve. That is a compelling thought. What might the future hold for treating joint pain? Something for all of us to ponder. We hope this deep dive has left you feeling informed and maybe a bit more empowered. Keep asking questions. Keep learning. 